start for that number talking about the hope the Lord, the mercy of God that we receive. And we see that reflected in this verse. And we're going to talk about that better. The meaning to come. Our topic for today is a call to total commitment. A talk, a call to total commitment. And I want to start by asking you a very weighty and important question. Do you want to make an eternal difference with your life? Do you really want and are you really willing to make an eternal difference with your life? Not just a temporal one, but a life that you no know, will catch across ages, will catch across generations. And when it is read about you, when it is heard about you, it will be one that was meaningful. Are you moving? Let me see your Okay. So still, and let us see what God has for us. No. You know, it is sad to know that most Christians are not willing as you are willing. I saw some hands that I don't know whether that they are not willing. No. But it is sad to know that many are not willing because of the pleasure and the entitlement of this age. And this explains why many Christians live lives scarcely different than that of their friends and neighbors that are lost in sin. We live at a time when many who claim the name of Jesus Christ have failed to demonstrate the difference Jesus can make in their lives. We have either ignored or forgotten or said no to God's call to live a life under his lordship. And the reason is simple. The failure to strongly commit ourselves to him and his services. That has led to a lot of entanglements. And that makes it difficult for you to, to and for the church you know, to give that eternal difference that is needed. That is needed. Many of you sitting before me have come up with new year resolutions. Let me see. Has anyone? Thank you very much. No, but you know what? Many are those who will give up just in some few months to come. Isn't it? Many will give up. Many have said, I am going to do this. And henceforth, I will do this. And this is what I am going to do. But before you discover, you don't even know what has happened. It's not intentional that you just stop. You just realize. As probably in some past years that you have made such commitment, you just see that you have you know, wandered away from that commitment. And that is because you have not really sometimes given yourself to, to total commitment to the Lord. And what commitment is an act of fervently, fervently accepting, promising, and agreeing to do something unfailingly. So when I promise, I have taken the commitment. When I agree that we are meeting at this start, it is an agreement, it is a commitment. So I am committed to you, and I am committed to see that at that time I am here. I have agreed, and it is expected that I shouldn't fail, which means that commitment requires lots of sincerity. You don't do that because of emotions. That is why you shouldn't, you should be very careful when you are making vows. Maybe when you are so excited, something has happened. Oh, I'm going to donate this. Hey, I'm going to do this. Oh, because something has just happened. No, oh, maybe for couples, something happens. Your husband or your wife does something to you, and you are just so happy. Emotionally, you are taken and you make some promise. You get some commitment that I will do this under the control of emotions. So, Commitments are not just to be made for your emotions, but all your entire being is supposed to be there. Your will, your mind, your intellect, your emotions are all supposed to be put together because it is not something that you should fail. It's something that when you promise, you have taken a vow. Just, just, just like the synonyms of, of some related words for commitment are dedication. Our engagement, obligation, promise, responsibility, undertaking a vow and allegiance. The relationship of God sat for all this money that I pledge allegiance to the Lord. I promise. No. 
that way. So that's what commitment so, really is. And so, when we get to the Bible, we get to our death, we understand that in the Christian life, doctrine and duty always go together. What we believe helps to determine how we behave. It is not enough, therefore, for us to understand Paul's doctrinal explanations of how we move from condemnation to justification. We must translate our learning, we must translate the doctrines, we must translate the teachings into living and show by our daily lives that we trust God's word. No, Paul who writes in most of his letters like Ephesians, Colossians, and Romans, no, he writes in and he stands in the doctrinal part of it and he gets the practical part of it. And where we are is actually the practical part of it and it begins with a verbal. It is true other versions. Don't start with a, with a verbal, like the King James version. He says, uh, I beseech you, verbal, brethren. Brethren, with brothers and sisters. And the end, I no, we don't say brothers, not as if sisters are excluded, but no, all are included. And he starts at least to paint a portrait of a life that is utterly unique, a life that can and will make an eternal difference, even in the, in the midst of perversity, in the midst of all the foolishness of this world. His explanation is that God's call is to total consecration or commitment. And for our simple understanding, he says, in my own words, God's call to commitment is spiritual, it's volitional, it's total, it's sacrificial, it's moral, and it's worshipful. Let us examine the plan after the other. One, God's call to total commitment is spiritual. God said, therefore, I want to skip, I urge you. I will come back to that. And I want to, if you can underline every word we are examining as we get from the word, we will examine all the words in phrase or in word in this verse 1. So he says, therefore, by the mercies of God, no, Paul opens this practical part with the therefore, and this is the fourth therefore in this letter. Romans 3 verse 20 is the therefore of, a, of eternal condemnation, declaring that the whole world is guilty before God. And chapter 1 to chapter 3 verse 20 demonstrates the total depravity and the universality of human sinfulness that all have sinned and have fallen short of God's glory. And what is the result of that? Death. Then he moves to chapter 5, verse 1, and uses a therefore of justification by faith alone. He says in this verse 1 that now we, now we have peace with Jesus Christ before. Which is a declaration that officially we have been judged and acquitted. When the case is judged at a court and a put that it means you have not been found guilty. This is amazing. We were guilty, but God has judged us now and I see that oh you deserve freedom. And that's the mercy of God, the living covenant that we are seeking about. And this is it that Apostle God is talking about. And chapter 3, chapter 5, so to one explores. No, this this process of our justification that Christ has won for us and that we can receive it by faith alone and nothing else. In chapter 8, verse 1, he uses the therefore of assurance of salvation, declaring our victory in Christ. And chapter 6 through chapter 8 examines God's work of sanctification to make us conform to Christ's likeness and no longer to worldliness. Because now you will be crucified with Christ, the life you live now is no longer yours, but it's a life that is meant for. It's a life under the leadership of Jesus Christ, making you to be more like Christ and no longer to the, the, the bad world that we live in. And I think as you say here that this stresses the fact that you can't lose your salvation. As so, 
sin. Your sin is a shock. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where we are, we have the level of dedication or commitment to service, which is the basis for other responsibilities we read in chapter 13, like being uh, respectful to the government, not the use of spiritual gifts, and helping one another. And so, what is our supposed to say? He's saying that our commitment to the Lord is supposed to be spiritual, meaning it is based on the finished works work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is based on what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, who incarnates God's mercy. And, and even demonstrated that while we were still sinners, we must die. So, the mercies of God here looks back to chapter 1, right through chapter 11, to the God of salvation. God has provided in Jesus Christ. And by implication, salvation is not by human endeavor or merit, but it is purely the work of God in Christ. It is not a grace like Pastor preached to us during the period of Christmas. It is grace. It is a graceful act. It is not grace that is wrong or that is do whatever thing to make it. The reason, you know, make cannot make the difference. That eternal difference. Or we committed today to God is because they are not spiritual. Meaning they have not been saved by the mercies of God yet. Either they are struggling to be saved by one thing or the other or through the sacrament. The Roman Catholic will tell us that that sacrament are those things that when you do, you get salvation, you receive grace from the Lord. And so are struggling to get to God by offering things to the church or by doing one thing or being moral and so on. But if you have received the mercy of God by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you will not be able to be committed to Him properly. You will struggle by your own human efforts and will always crash. So total commitment is impossible if you do not have created God's mercy. Number two, God's call to total commitment is volitional. He says, I urge you by the mercies of God to present, to present. Volition is the mental power or ability of choosing something. It is a conscious choice or decision, which means that a life of commitment voluntarily yields to the Lordship of Christ. You are not coerced, you are not pressurized, you are not forced to do that. Voluntarily and consciously because the offering of your body is something you alone can do and must do. I cannot do it for you. You cannot do it for me. You cannot do it for your parents or your siblings or your children. Nobody can do it for another. The technical term that is used here as presenting is place aside. And when I read this, I remember or I think of those who play that is who do play that here. Yeah. Now you know that when you know that you have an appointment with a Jackie next Sunday or next month, any small thing, especially when the amount of abuse now, any small thing you take and put aside or place aside. And it is not to go back there because you know when you go there, you will be subtracted and at the end you will not fulfill your commitment. It's that kind of of, of term that is used here, place aside, which means set apart by God. And to say that, for you to be totally committed to the things of God and to God Himself, you must be set apart. You must have a place beside by God Himself. You cannot place yourself. You cannot set yourself apart. It is God who does it, but you have a choice to say, I surrender. And when you say, God, I surrender, I acknowledge your mercy. I couldn't save myself, but, but you did it for me in Christ Jesus. You gave your only son. Oh God, I surrender. And God sets you apart. He places you inside. 
So this is your business. It is not mine. I have got mine. You have yours. Your child or your mother or your spouse has his. It's not a one thing affair, by the way. Because that is you not know, the text that is conjugated here means that it is a, a once and for all action. Just like Christ gave himself once and for all for the permission of our sins, we surrender, we present our body to him once and for all. Not that we give and tomorrow we take. Like a driver, you know, uh, you have a driver that is driving and you're sitting in the car and, and you reach it somewhere, you know, you are anxious to drive and you reach it somewhere to say, no, that now I can drive. Like some of us who are learning driving. Now, and sometimes half plus, eh, it is a trouble. And now, I know that, you know, if I drive and I'm going to stand at a hill, I will leave all the vehicles behind. So, if it's on the level that, oh, this is my best moment at that time. Now, at that time, maybe we reach at the level that I say, I'm going to keep it the same. I can handle this matter now. But when we arrive at, at the point where it's a I say, I've got to come and take it. I cannot handle this. That is not that. The test, the verb that is used here is a verb that demonstrate that it is something you do once and for all. You do it just like couples get into a union, not to come out. Only fools believe so. And sometimes I'm, I'm tempted to think that some are fools when they start to take their back and say, no better and the best. Those, I can suspect such that those are the people who are desiring that tomorrow they will divorce. And tomorrow, if you hear a divorce case from that, just know that the answer was for better and for best. So, when life was better, eh? No, no, eh? So, they don't want the case that when life is worse, you know, when life is worse, I come out. The other one, best. How? No, a, a, a competitive and superlative. How do you say for better? It should be another bad word. So, it is not something that you give and take. That is why it needs to be positional. It needs to be something that you do it consciously. You are not sleeping. You are doing that consciously. You know? Remember I said you are not coerced. You are not forced. You are not pressurized. Because God does not coerce. He does not believe. But because he does not pressurize it, but what does he do? He, he bleeds, he bets on him. Some of us still find ourselves in all sorts of immorality. Maybe because we were coerced, we were pressurized, we were forced to receive Jesus Christ or to be baptized. When children get to some certain age, and parents that need to get baptized, and sometimes you are telling them when they have not even really repented or sin. And so they are doing that to please you. They are not doing that consciously with all the emotions and all the will and all the mental power put in place. And tomorrow they are not and they want to fight. So, just say, ah, oh, I want to get baptized, you know, they say so, so that they be at the center stage, all the celebrations. Some people like when matters are turning around them, you know, all the celebrations, they have come all the population. Like in the village, they will be drums around and move all over, and you are the one that, that has called the people, they want to do that. Some who get to be baptized or to repent, and say, you know, if I repent, I can easily have a wife in this church. Somebody had told me why we were tampering this stuff. We were taking ground here like this. So, and we were feeling this place. He said, No, they are very beautiful ladies. And during the week, no Mondays, they were coming for we were going for prayers. When they were there, you know, his eyes were only seeing the uh, beautiful ladies that were there. You know? And you know, he said, No, they are very beautiful ladies in this church. And if I come to this church, I can have my wife. So some will repent because they know that they will have a wife and they will get married. Some will struggle either to get baptized or to do something because of marriage or because of one thing or the other. And at the end, the commitment to the church covenant 
So at the end, the commitment to 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 the brotherhood, not to the brotherhood, is not there because it wasn't for this son and that. Day. There were some pressures that you know, were pushing. It wasn't an internal pressure of the work of the mercy of Christ inside, saying that you know, go, you know, baptize, or go do this and go say that, or, or that you take this engagement and you do that. So, I plead on you that as prophet Isaiah will behold the holiness of God and immediately present his body to the Lord. And I like this related to the word that Paul has used here. I will talk about that later. I urge the word we need to encourage or to earnestly ask. No, from Isaiah was serving the Lord, yes. But at this time, he is receiving his call and his commission, and he is saying, God, I dedicate myself to you. Say, no, but he is help the holiness of God, and he said, Oh, you can be a man with possibility. You look at his his depravity, he looks at the universality of sinfulness of all human beings and look at himself first and said, God, I surrender to you. I present my body, I present my life to you so that I can go and be missionary and help my family. Number three, God's call to total commitment is total. It's total. It says your body. And the reason why Paul will say your body is he's addressing the congregation, he's addressing you know, the church, he's addressing the disciples. So that's why the humanity is there. But you no, know, it is your body, which means that every part, everything about you is related to the Lord. When you have not totally surrendered to Christ, you cannot be totally committed to Him. When you have given him part of you and another part of you to manage, maybe because you have learned management skills at one university or at wherever, or you are taking some courses or seminars in management and you think I can manage, no, you have you have done no a, a fashion and you think no I can no fashion myself better. No, you want to be committed to the law. Be be before we we receive Christ, we use our body anyhow, anyway, anytime, the way we want. But now that we have repented, our body, every member of our body, is supposed to be used for the Lord because in the temple of the Holy Spirit, His Spirit dwells in us, and so our members now are supposed to be instruments of righteousness. Your body here means inside out. It means you know, your whole mind is involved, your will, your emotions, your body, soul, or spirit is involved. And Paul said in Colossians 3 23 that whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to make. How should you do it? Heartily. And what does that mean? It means that you do it with your whole soul. It is it is generated from the inside, which means you are doing it wholeheartedly, willingly, with gladness, cheerfully, with enthusiasm, genuinely, and without growth, without any growth, without growing. Because you have been born, it has been a volitional act that you have taken. You have said, This is what I'm going to do. Nobody forced you. And so it should flow from the inside. So that when the mouth is speaking, or when you are acting, it is right. And this means that the kind of feelings and emotions you have while doing anything you are assigned to do, whether and wherever, determines or tells your attitude, you know, the height of your commitment and the degree of your understanding of who is in control of your life. And Paul, in this Colossians, in, the, in this context, he's talking to slaves. Slaves that you know, had no authority of themselves, they, they, they could be sold, they, they, they could be killed. The master could kill or could sell without, and nobody would question. Like the case of Onesimus, and Paul would be pleading with Philemon. 
you want to accept it back. And as you go to work, you don't know what your affection will tell you to do. You don't know what you are setting in a house as a husband or woman. You don't know what he will tell you the kind of food you need to do today. But he said that whatever you need to do to this your master, do it heartily. Even if you are not prepared to cook arrow today, and he tells you to cook arrow. Even if you are not prepared to do this, and he tells you to do that, do it heartily. And as you do that, they are going to see Christ in you. They are going to see that eternal difference that you are creating. That's why God, you know, through Peter, will say, you know, the wife should be submissive to their husband, so that even the unbelief being husband can even surrender to the Lord. And could that mean that some men are not yet Christian because of your lack of submission? Yes. Scripture teaches us that partial obedience is complete disobedience. 99% faith, faithfulness is uh, a complete unfaithfulness in the sight of the Lord. And Moses and King Saul are good biblical examples that tell us how when we fail to be totally yielded to the Lord, to give God our best and you know, present our body, you know, everything about us, not to him. When I say your body, it means everything rotating and concerning you, whether they are finances, whether they are your, it's your marriage, whether it's your career, it's your academics, whatever it is. When you fail to give God your best and you are entitled, you will not receive the best from the Lord. Now, you see, Moses who needs you know, the promised land because he didn't give God total obedience. King Saul who needs his, who lose his, his leadership position because of disobedience. So, your service in 2021 should be generated from the heart. Because if the heart is not involved, all that you do is going to be fake. I remember very, very you know, active in the church here, connecting South by that time the system was inside a lot of things. But I'm not surrendered to Christ and know him personally. One that I come on Saturday, if you remember. We were still teaching at the mother here, and I, and I told her that I want us to meet, work for, but I just want us to meet and we were still. And she accepted. We spent about two hours in the office there, I guess, no post meeting. And she ex- explained to me the gospel and, and ministered to me. And from that day, I wasn't just you not know, doing things from the, from the outside, but there was now nah, it was all generated from the heart. Because now the heart was involved. And as time was going, I was getting God calling me clear. God's call is struck out. So may we present our body to the Lord so that God can continue his work, even in and through us. And by that, we need to be instruments of righteousness, Romans 6 13. Number four, God's call to total commitment is sacrificial. He says living sacrifice. You know what Christ did for the redemption of the church was selfless. It wasn't for himself. It was unconditional. There was no condition of if. If you do this, you will not. The only condition that you have for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, that is the condition. That whosoever believes in him, the condition is faith in him alone. And that doesn't require money. It doesn't require uh, animals. If it was animal sacrifices again, no, all the cows and all the cows and all the goats, all the sheep, it would have been finished. In fact, salvation would have been for the rich. Because you and I don't have all the money to spend every time. So he did that sacrificial. And we need to do the same to others and to this world. The, the, these two words, living sacrifice is an oxymoron. And an oxymoron is is 
uh, a literary device that describes two words used together that have to seem to have opposite meanings. So living and sacrifice all the powers that we had during Christmas and New Year are next to living. All the chickens, all the what are the difference between chickens and uh, farms? Uh, somebody said farm. <laughs> <laughs> so, some people say chicken is when you see a like a farm in the water you So, so, so all of those are not alive again. Which means that what is Paul communicates here is that we need to be to be alive and dead in some cases, alive in some cases and dead in some cases. Which means simply that he is saying that we need to be alive to the Savior and his will for our lives, whatever it is, and wherever that will is leading us. And we need to be dead to ourselves, to our bodies, to our desire, to our plans, to our human philosophies, to our traditions, and to our wisdom. All human ever we should be dead to. In fact, some of them dead to sin and alive in righteousness. And every sacrifice is costly. And I should remind you again that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was costly. It wasn't any year yet sacrifice. Those of you who have visited the garden man before, you know that you don't take anything to the gods, as I would say, right? And so if God has sacrificed this way, and and give us this costly sacrifice. Then we too should be committed in a sacrificial way to give it. The Old Testament presents us two uh, biblical characters, Adam and Jesus Christ, that are good examples of living sacrifices. You know, when Adam was to be sacrificed scripturally, in the insides of the scripture, Isaac was sacrificed and he was a living sacrifice because he gave himself willingly and obediently and, and, and God saw that and provided a lamb in his place. And that was pointing to another better and worse than for all sacrifice that we got Jesus Christ. And he did not just die, but he is risen. And he seated at the right hand side. So sometimes you should know that when we gather openly on Sunday this way, one of the reasons we do that is you know, the church was created on Sunday. Yet more, we also celebrate and commemorate his resurrection. And he is the, the living sacrifice as our artist, as our advocate. That is where he is living for us. And this request is so that. We be totally yielded to him, committed to him, and see that we do exactly what he requests from us. Sacrificially, sacrifice to your brother, sacrifice not for your sister, sacrifice for the things of the Lord. Number five, it's moral. God's call to not a man is moral. He says, holy, acceptable to God. And the word acceptable here, like in some versions, is good. It, it is well pleasing. And this commitment honors God greatly because He saw while here on earth was morally upright, ethically it was okay. And God demands as well that you to be morally okay before Him. That it is not sufficient to confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But your actions and your words that will make a difference to the public that should back up that confession on daily basis as we let people see that truly, truly this man is making a difference. And this is what somebody will say the fifth gospel are coming to you. That what gospel are you writing? We have Matthew, Matthew, John. What is your own? Because people are looking at your own life to see whether it is reflecting the life that is in Matthew, Matthew, and John, that you have believed that that gospel that is presented there. Before the Samaritan woman could wash in spirit and in truth, or they thought, God took her into a 
into a worship theology class to tell her that worship is both spiritual in the realm of the spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit in that context, beyond the worship is somewhere, and that it is also rational, but it is also moral. It is also moral by testing and not testing by asking. Go and do your answer. That was a moral aspect. I said, Not said, you said right. So our our lives needs to be backed up by what we confess. That is why I, I say something about verse 2 here. Verse 2 here helps us to know how we can live moral lives. And for that to happen, he says we must reject the pressure to conform to this world's immorality. The word conform in verse 2 means to form or to mold after something. Like those who mold blocks, there's a mold and force the sand inside so that it looks like it takes the shape of that mold. He said you should not conform yourself, excuse yourself, and, and let yourself you know, be like the world and start acting like the world. And you know, the, 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 the text that is used here is present passive imperative. Which means it is an ongoing action that God is warning us again. God is warning you that every day, since you need to make an eternal difference, make sure that every day you you not squeeze yourself into the fashion of the world, into the things of the world. Don't try to that because you no, know, they are praying and are succeeding, they are building houses, they are doing this and they are succeeding. That God, let me also no no no, don't do that. Don't do that. If you failed yesterday, rise up and know that it is a continuous action that you need to find on daily basis not to be conformed, not to squeeze yourself into the world's agenda and affair. So it says, stop being conformed. Stop being, stop being conformed to, uh, to this perverse age or generation, that's the word is there and for the world, no, to this perverse age or generation. So I implore you not to allow yourself to be molded and shaped after the passing of this age because salvation requires total morality, not morality without salvation. Many are very moral, but in the depths of the mercy of God, they are very like so how can we tell that people regarding morality? Remember, anything less would be immorality, unholy, and unacceptable before God. Some of us, even sitting before me, watch it like this, and sometimes may end up on beds of excesses. The word used in Ephesians 5.18, it leads to the most people. The original term there, excess, which means that no, it leads alcoholism, no, uh, sexual immorality, and all of those things, even pride, all of those things that when you are true with, you no longer behave right. The Holy Spirit is no longer in control of your life. That way. Many will gather for worship and such, but will fall into such things later. And remember that just as in marriage, 99% faithfulness is not needed. God still doesn't need it. He will commit it. Therefore, Paul would say that you should continually be transformed. And that's the word that 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 is metamorphosis. That you should continually be changed on daily basis. And how do you do this? By renewing your mind, by making your mind new again. And how do you do that? By continuous study of the word of God and its application. Not just hearing, but applying it. As you do that, the world will not see you. Jacob will say, flee. That resists, no, he said, resist the devil and you will flee from it. Which means, if you are transformed on that place, it is a lot of resistance you are doing. You are metamorphosed, you are changing into Christ likeness every day and becoming more like Christ and no longer like a perverse age and generation. The devil is 
this man will just be taking his love with his alone. He's just be gone. So that is what it says. Renew your mind because the great battles are fought in the mind. And when you win the battles of the mind, you can win everywhere. When you lose the battle in the mind, you will lose everywhere. Number six. Last one. Our God, God's call to total commitment is worship. It says reasonable service of worship. Other pleasures will talk about truth and worship. Truth and worship. So God's call to commitment is expressed in reasonable or true service, which means rational and intelligent worship. Rational or intelligent worship lifestyle in the emphasis here where you serve and worship God with correct knowledge of who God is, correct theology. And this means that every true worshiper should know who he is worshiping and know and have an accurate knowledge of who that God is. Because your true worship affects the man so much that you get to know the more as your man is with you who you are really worshiping. So that you know who you worship. Is it God now a greater thing in your heart? God told the Samaritan that you people don't know what people are worshiping. Why? Because for about 700 years, the Jews and the Samaritans have created you know, a religious difference. Because the Samaritans believed only in Genesis Exodus, they become number two for me. And they rejected the prophets. The prophets. Because the Old Testament is the Hebrew, but it's divided into two. You know? the, the, the first five books, the Torah and the prophets. But they rejected the prophet, and it is in the prophet that a lot of prophecy is given about the Messiah, about Jesus Christ, and they rejected it. And Jesus is telling him, standing before her, and saying, Here am I, the Messiah, prophesied, even in the prophet. You know, but you have rejected it. You don't know who you are worshiping. Do you know who you are worshiping? Paul, in, in uh, Acts chapter 17, gets to Athens and he sees many gods there and he gets to a point the statue starts there they don't even know the name of that god all that god had it but this one what is it they, 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 they don't say this is an unknown god and Paul is disturbed because you cannot worship any deity if you don't know who that deity is because you don't also know the kind of worship that he expects from you so, 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 I was a pop point there that that man, that man is Jesus Christ, is God, is here, the one who created the maker of heaven and earth. My well beloved, do you really know who you worship? And how can you know when you have rejected some portions of God's word in order to satisfy your grief? and gratify your worldly desires. How did the Samaritans know anything about the Messiah when they have rejected God's word through his prophet, like Isaiah and Jeremiah? How they worship even this year to be reasonable or true when you will not abandon your false doctrine because you know accepting it means for going the actual pleasures and position in offers. They say, you don't cover with the blood of Jesus. You say, it works. I just finished preaching here in the first service, and I said so, and just standing behind here, someone was praying for with another person, and, and then I covered the person with the blood of Jesus. <laughs> no. I called the person and I rebuked the person. Doctrines that are taught biblically, the blood of Jesus meant for cleansing of sin and nothing else. If you want to pray for protection and security, say, God, protect me. God, let every something blow on my way. Be turning up. Pray such. Cover my house. Cover the car, the windscreen. How will the driver see as he drives? After the driver there. Do 
Madison. Because you know that when you pray, I call the Lord of Jesus, it is very resounding, it is very powerful. How do you have your worship in you? Therefore, the other two words I'm going to use, I urge you. I urge you. Some of you this word, urge, which it means encourage or endlessly asking. I encourage you. You listening to me that, that as I've operated the mercy of God, that you did already, I urge you to continue to be. Committed to the things of the Lord. And this year has started and is ongoing. And for you who has not surrendered to Jesus Christ, I am earnestly asking and imploring and begging that you will do so even today. The issue of presenting yourself to the Lord, like Prophet Isaiah, when we beheld the holiness of God, he didn't say, I will. I will go and consult my people, I will put that letter. He did it immediately and said, Father, you can be a man of a clinic living across people that are all sinful as well. I urge you, I plead, I beg you that you surrender to Christ so that you can be totally committed to him. Because God's call to total commitment is spiritual and that's where it starts with your relationship with the Father. It's volitional. Only you can do that. It's total. You offer everything. Everything. It's sacrificial. You render sacrificial services to God. And this happens only when you have also recognized His mercies and know what He has done and say, consider what He has done. Like what we say from chapter 1 to chapter 11. I surrender. I surrender. It is moral and it is worship. The kind of call to total commitment cannot be over exercised when you consider God's mercy. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for speaking to us. We bless you all holy name and we ask that you help us to be committed to you more than ever. And anyone who has not surrendered to you, God, Make an appointment with such a work that he meets me in this place and that he takes that appointment with you and meets with you. Give this hour, give it today, and make this right. Bless us and bless your world. Jesus' name.